Oh, it feels like forever since I've been here. Um, and uh, I had to uh, look at my calendar to see what we were even studying in this class. No, just kidding. But it almost felt that way. I appreciate uh, Gary Jenkins and uh, Jeff Goodale filling in uh, the last two Sunday mornings and had several filling in on Wednesday nights. And uh, uh, Richard will be teaching this Wednesday night in here and uh, somebody else the Wednesday night after that. I think it's Josh. I'll be gone the next two Wednesdays, so uh, lots of fun, uh, but uh, we are studying, or at least trying to study this quarter, on Sunday mornings, the topic of how can we understand the Bible alike. And uh, as you can see, we've been studying this for a while. This is lesson number 16 uh, out, of, uh, out of 102, so uh, we're, we're almost there, uh, just uh, a few more years, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to wrap up. Uh, this particular study, but how can we understand the Bible alike? We've spent some time in this class talking about the fact that the only way we can understand the Bible alike is for us to approach the Bible with a firm conviction that every word in the Bible is inspired of God. Every one of them. Every one of them has been given to us by God. And if we'll approach it with that mindset and approach it alike in that mindset, with an understanding that the Bible can be understood... And if it's going to be understood at all, then it's going to be understood alike. Then we can come to the Bible and appreciate the fact that God commands us in some passages like Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, where He commands us to understand what the will of the Lord is. And we've had several other classes where we've pointed out some things that are necessary for us to to come to terms with when we are going to understand the Bible alike. But what I want to start this morning... And uh, we'll continue on this particular thought uh, and the variations of this thought for the next several weeks. Is that if we're going to understand how how we can understand the Bible alike, then we need to understand how the Bible authorizes. Um, I don't remember how long ago it was, about five or six lessons ago. We talked about the fact that if we're going to understand the Bible alike, then we need to recognize that it is all authoritative, that it is all sufficient, and it has been all delivered. So we spent some time in that lesson talking about the fact that the Bible is all authoritative, meaning Scripture has all authority. But I want to get more specific in, this, in these next uh, few, few studies and say how, how can we figure out how the Bible authorizes. And let, let, me, let me start off with some passages to help us to get an understanding of what we're talking about. The... Uh, the necessity of authority in religious matters is, uh, is crucially important. In Colossians chapter 3, I think that's the first passage I've got up here. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Think about what God says here. God says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want you to think about how much ground that one verse covers. Look at the second word. Whatever you do. What does that include? That includes whatever you do. That's a big word. God's saying, here's what you do, and whatever you do, whether it be in word, things that you do, your actions, or in deed... Words, things you say, deeds, things you do, whether it be in word or deed, do, what's the next little word? Do all, everything that you do, whatever it is. You've got to do it in the name of the Lord. What does it mean to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus? To do it by His authority. In Acts chapter 4, a passage that uh, would be good if you wrote... Acts chapter 4, particularly verse 10, if you just want to write one verse, uh, in the margin of your Bible next to Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, because if we want to understand what does in the name of the Lord mean, well, I can use an illustration. And I can say an illustration uh, that a police officer comes to your door and knocks on the door and says, open up in the name of the law. Well, what if you stand behind the door and bicker with him and say, well, what does it mean in the name of the law? Well, we know what that means, right? We know that he has authority as an officer of the law to, uh, to command that that door be open. Doesn't always work, does it, David? Uh, no, okay. Um, but uh, he has a certain amount of authority. 
When God says, do all in the name of the Lord, I, from that illustration, I can say, okay, that means I've got to have authority. But here's a Bible passage that shows us that that's what it means. Acts chapter 3, if you go back one chapter. Acts chapter 3, uh, what happens to Peter and John? Good, they're arrested. Uh, and when the, why were they arrested? Exactly, because they healed the lame. Y'all are really good at these answers. Because they healed the lame man there uh, at, at the gate of the temple. So they are arrested, thrown in prison. In Acts chapter 4, they are brought before the council. And they are asked, and this is the New King James, so you might have a different word here. They are asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Here, you've healed this guy. By what power or by what name have you done this? What are they asking? Where'd you get the power? Where'd you get the authority to do this? Think about uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. If you go back to the old King James, Matthew 28, 18, it says, Jesus says, all power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Is that what he says? Matthew 28, 18, Old King James, all power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. New King James, what does it say in Matthew 28, 18? All authority. What's the difference between, in that passage, the word power and the word authority? Same thing. Interesting that he's asked here, by what power? Could that be talking about their authority? If not, by what name certainly does. By what power or by what authority have you healed this man? So Peter begins answering, and I want us to drop down, and I don't have the verse numbers on here just for sake of space. But down in verse 10, Jesus, or Peter says that he wants it to be known to, all of the, to everyone, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by him, by his power, by his authority, this man stands before you whole. When Colossians 3.17 says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, God is saying we've got to have authority for everything that we do, in word or in deed. Because Peter goes on to say, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Is there any other authority, is there any other power that's going to save us other than Jesus? No. And if that's true, then go back to Colossians 3.17. Is there any other power or any other authority that we need to follow and obey? It's absolutely essential that we have biblical authority uh, in, in religious matters today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Very short verse where God tells us that we are obligated to walk by faith and not by sight. What does it mean to walk by faith? What, is that, what does that phrase mean? I walk by faith. How do you do that? Okay, doing what the will of God says to do. What would you say, Dirk? Okay, if I'm supposed to walk by faith, where does faith come from? Well, faith comes from hearing the word of God. So how am I going... How am I going to determine which way, if I'm not supposed to walk by sight, how do I walk by faith? Okay. There's a difference between walking in a direction that I think I need to go and walking in a direction that God says I need to go. And those are often two different directions. God says instead of walking after your own eyes and your own sight, Walk by faith. How do I do that? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So I walk according to the Word of God. And there's no other way to please God than to do that. If I walk by sight, I cannot please God because I'm not walking by faith. And so if you talk about where, where's my authority today in religious matters, it has to be in the fact that I come to Scripture and I use the Scripture to build my faith and, and by which to walk. We don't have time to look at this whole passage. Matthew chapter 21. Uh, 
the, scribe, the uh, chief priests and the elders come to Jesus and they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Even they recognize that there's got to be, it's similar to the question that was asked of Peter and John in Acts 4. Even they recognize there's got to be authority, there's got to be power. Where are you getting this authority that you're doing these things? And of course, Jesus turns it back to them and says, okay, I'll tell you, but you first tell me the baptism of John, where was it from? Was it from heaven or from men? Jesus says, here's John, he's baptizing people. Where did that come from? Did that come from heaven or from men? And of course, they wouldn't answer the question because they realized they were in a pinch either way that they went on that answer. But what is Jesus asking? Here's, here's a practice. Here's something that's being done religiously in the name of God. Where did it come from? Is that a question that we ought to ask about our beliefs, about our practices today? Here's something that that we do in worship. Where did it come from? Here's something I do in my daily life for God. Where did it come from? Am I doing things in worship? Am I doing things in the church that are from men or from heaven? And does it make a difference? Does it make a difference if I've got it from men or if I've got it from God? Obviously it does. Obviously it made a difference to Jesus because he asked the question. Where does our authority come from? Our authority does not come from men. Our authority must come from heaven. A couple other things to consider. In this, in this matter that's of uh, what I think is tremendous importance, just this discussion of uh, religious author- or authority and religious matters, Unless we know how the Bible authorizes, we cannot be sure of anything that we're doing or saying. I want you to think about this. Think about some of these things that we read about in the Old Testament. If I were to go back and find something in the Old Testament, uh, like Abel uh, offering an animal sacrifice, or Noah building an ark, or Abraham building an altar in order that he might worship God, or any of these other things that are listed here. You think about the, the uh, Jewish men, Israelite men, and their responsibility three times a year to go to the city of Jerusalem uh, to worship God. You think about David, uh, King David, and his, his command to use uh, instrumental music uh, in worship. The Israelites could not approach God directly. They had to go through uh, a priest. They, often, they, they would burn incense as a part of their worship. I want you to go back and look at these things that you read in the Old Testament. And we could even add some things here uh, from the New Testament, but I didn't. If you look at all of these things, if I don't know how the Bible authorizes, how can I be sure of anything in the realm of religion? Or let me ask it this way. If I can do these things, if I can offer an animal sacrifice, if I can build an altar, if I can just go through a priest... If I, need, if, I, if I can go to Jerusalem three times a year to worship, if I can use instrumental music in worship, if I can do these things, or even if I must do these things, how can I know that? Think about the question. If I can or even must do any of those things on that list, how can I know that? What would I do to know that? You know the answer. Or ask it the other way. If I cannot do these things to acceptably worship and serve God today, or if I must not do these things, how would I know that? How would I know today that I am not supposed to offer an animal sacrifice if Abel did it and it was pleasing to God? Did Abel do it? Yes. Was it pleasing to God? Yes. Am I supposed to do it or am I not supposed to do it? How do I know? How do I know I'm not supposed to do that? If, if, uh, if they went to Jerusalem three times a year uh, to celebrate their uh, religious feasts, these uh, Israelite men, what about me? Am I supposed to do that or not supposed to do that? And when you answer that question, how do you know that's what you're supposed to do? How do we decide today what we are supposed to do in religion and what we are not supposed to do, or what we are permitted to do, or what we are not permitted to do. 
Because the Bible tells me so. Say, what'd you say? That's it. That's so plain, so simple. It's in the simplest song we sing, right? Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. But why do people not get that? Why is it that we can say, because the Bible tells me so, but why is that difficult to understand? How is it that I can ascertain Bible authority today for what I do? How do I know on this list of things which things would be permitted, if any, and which things would not be permitted? You see, we have to be students of the Bible. This series of uh, classes we're going to have for the next couple weeks emphasizes the fact that we have to know how the Bible authorizes because God demands such. God demands that we have biblical authority for what we do. This just review, we're supposed to walk by faith, which is by the word, and we can only do it if we please God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 6. God tells us, depending on the translation, not to go beyond or not to think beyond what is written. So where's my authority? My authority is in what is written. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul talked about the fact, and I know we looked at these a few weeks ago, so I'm going to quickly go through them. But he talked about the fact that they were turning away to a different gospel. There were those who wanted to pervert the gospel. There were those who, there were those who wanted another gospel. But Paul says in this passage, there's only one. You can't have somebody preaching another gospel because there is only one gospel. Is that my authority? I don't have the right, Revelation 22. I don't have the right to add to it. I don't have the right to take away from it. If it's my authority, then I must come to it with the utmost respect for what it says and be ready to obey it and whatever it says. Let me give you a couple thoughts on this. The Scriptures teach that in our lives, whether it be in our worship or whether it be in our work for God, that we must do only that which is authorized by God. Is that true? Let me back up a second. Is that true? Give me a verse that says that. It's easy because I've given you a lot of them. Does Colossians 3.17 teach that? Does Colossians 3.17 teach that we must do only that which is authorized by God. Whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord. We've got to have authority for everything that we do. So, that being said, it must be possible for human beings to ascertain what's authorized by the Word of God, don't you think? Would God command us to do something if we couldn't figure out what was authorized and what was not? We must be able to figure it out. And we must not only be able to figure it out, it must also be possible that we can practice only that which is authorized, don't you think? Does that make sense? If God commands us, do only what's authorized, then there's two things. I must be able to figure it out, what's authorized, and I must be able to do it, follow through, to practice only that which is authorized. Otherwise, God wouldn't command me to do it. So how do we figure that out? How do we ascertain scriptural authority for our actions and our attitudes. I know I'm jumping through some of this. A lot of this is review uh, from one lesson we had before. Uh, but I want us to see and recognize the emphasis um, of this point that we've got to have authority uh, in religious matters. God's not going to tolerate something that is not authorized, even if it is intended to be. We said a minute ago that Abel offered an animal sacrifice. What did Cain do? You said something. Sounded good, I think. I don't know. I didn't. Okay, Mickey, shout it out. Cain intended to offer the sacrifice. Did he? Did he? Yes, he did. First fruits of the ground is what he offered as his sacrifice. Do you believe that Cain intended to worship God? Do you think he intended to make a sacrifice to God? 
that, but what happened? He worshiped God, at least that's what he thought he was doing, and surely he intended, intended it to be accepted, but was it acceptable? Is there a difference between that which is authorized and that which we do that we intend to kind of it to be authorized, but it's not? There is a way that seems right. I've got that verse down here somewhere. It's going to be on one of these slides eventually. It was on, uh, it was on our slide uh, a few weeks ago uh, from Proverbs. I think it's chapter, Proverbs 14, 12. It's twice in the book of Proverbs. There is a way that seems right in the man, but the end thereof is the way of death. He intended it to be such. Go ahead. Uh, is, it, is it assumed or known that he would have had animals of his own to make, uh, to, to offer as a sacrifice? It, it, would be, it would be proper for us to assume that he had access to whatever was necessary for him to worship God. Um, uh, you know, is God, we, we, we don't know every detail about what happened with those two sacrifices. Here's what we do know. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What was the difference between Abel's sacrifice and Cain's sacrifice? According to he that's Hebrews 11.4. What's the difference between Abel's sacrifice and Cain's sacrifice? Faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing the word of God. Somebody obeyed God and somebody didn't. Richard? Yes, yes, and that's another, another good illustration on, uh, of Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Were his intentions pure? To, when, when, the, when the oxen stumbled at, the th at Nacon's threshing floor, um, were, his, were his intentions pure when he touched the ark? Sounded like that, didn't it? Joe, Joe, Joe caught what I caught that... My words almost sounded not like what they were supposed to say. Were his intentions pure? Yes. yes. Are intentions everything? If our intentions are great and honorary and pure, and yet the action is not authorized, how does God view that? Okay, God says uh, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Our responsibility is obedience. And God does not tolerate uh, disobedience. Malachi chapter 1. Not only was, and, and I put this up here because we got one from the beginning of the Old Testament. Here's one from the end of the Old Testament. Where not just one man's worship, but an entire nation's worship. Shirley was intended. Sorry, Shirley, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about this one up here. Shirley was intended to be acceptable, but it wasn't. There, there, there are some sharp words that God uses towards His people when they don't worship Him properly in the Old Testament. Here's one passage. Malachi chapter 1. God says, A son honors his father, and a master his servant. If I am the father, where is my honor? If I am the master, where is my reverence? What does God demand in worship? Reverence and honor. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in, uh, in what way have we defiled you? The Lord, the table of the Lord is contemptible. When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, they come to make an, a sacrifice to God and they go and find this lamb that's blind. What good is a blind lamb? Not so good, right? I mean, when, when you take, the, when you take the, the sheep out to the pasture and you got one who's blind, you know, that's kind of a pain, isn't it? You know, you got to nurse him along. All right, here's what, we don't need him. If you come and you offer the blind, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not, what was God's view? What did he command? What, what kind of, didn't we study this in the book of Exodus? What kind of animal? Without spot 
and without blemish. Not blind, not lame, not sick. So if you disregard the authority of God on what kind of animal to offer, God says the result is evil. So God says, here's, here's the part I want us to see. Okay, offer it then to your governor. Go ahead, offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? If the governor tells you to do something and you do something different, God says, hey, go do that to the governor. You think, he'll, you think he'd like it? No. We understand the laws of the land and our responsibility to obey the laws of the land. And God says, go ahead, you know, offer that there and see if that's acceptable. See if he'll look on it favorably. And you know he won't. Point is, why would you do that to God? Why, why do people say, well, I, I, I think God, I, I, know that's, I know this is what the Bible says, but I, just, you know, I think God will understand if I go and do this. Why do we believe that our disobedience, but yet our purity of intentions, might be a cause for us to say, well, I think God will understand. You read not just the Old Testament, but the entirety of Scripture. Um, God has a lot of things like this where he says, okay, what's most important? Why don't you entreat God's favor? See if he will accept you favorably. And then you know what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. Do you think their worship in the New Testament was intended to be acceptable to God? Were the scribes and Pharisees concerned about things being acceptable? Yeah. What did Jesus say about their worship in Matthew chapter 15? Verse 8. What are they doing? They're drawing near, but where's their heart? Hear their lips, hear their tongues, hear their words. They're drawing near, but their heart is far from me. Why? Verse 9. In vain do they worship me. Think about this. They're worshiping God. They're apparently using words or phrases and things are coming from their lips that, are draw, that, that sound like they're drawing near to God. They're using the right words. But Jesus says, in vain they are worshiping me. How can their worship be vain? What does the word vain mean? Empty. Empty. Useless. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Here they were elevating their own thoughts, their own teachings, their own beliefs. Surely they intended to be acceptable to God, but they were anything but. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 7, I think it's the first words, one of the very first words where Jesus looks at them and calls them hypocrites. What they were doing was not acceptable to God because it was not being offered in the way that God uh, designed and authorized for it to be done. Often when you read the Bible, you'll come across, especially in the old King James, but even sometimes in the newer translations too, you'll come across this word strange. Uh, what does that mean? Well, when you come across it, just insert this idea of something not being acceptable because it's not authorized. Here's one place. Nadab and Abihu offered strange or profane fire to the Lord in Leviticus 10. What does is, what is strange fire mean? It's not, the one he authorized. it's not the one he authorized. Unauthorized fire is what was offered before the Lord and it wasn't acceptable. Solomon loved many strange women. Does that mean they were funny looking? Does that mean they had weird accents? You know, bad hairdos? Um... True. Many of them did have weird accents. When, when, when you've got, uh, when you've got uh, how many wives? 700 wives. How, how, many, uh, how many concubines? 1,000 women. Uh, where did he get many of them? Foreign countries. So they did have accents, right? I mean, weird accents. Maybe different, different languages that he didn't understand. Uh, is that what made them strange? Their accents. Why is the word strange used here then? They're unauthorized. What was unauthorized about them? Did God command them? Um, 
uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, first five verses there. Deuteronomy 12, first five verses there. Uh, Exodus chapter 34. Uh, I mean, just all over the place. Did God not command them to make no covenants with the people of the land they were going into and specifically not to marry them? Yes, he commanded them that. So what did Solomon do? Went ahead and did it. Went ahead and did that which was not authorized. Same thing happened in, in Nehemiah chapter 13 or even prior to this uh, where they transgressed God by marrying strange or some translations say pagan wives. Same idea. They were not authorized to marry these. In fact, it's in this passage uh, in, in Nehemiah chapter 13 that refers back to Solomon's actions and calls it sinful. That what he did was sinful in doing that which was not authorized. Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh, Jude verse 7. What does the word strange mean? It was not authorized by God. When there were males going after males, that is unauthorized by God. It was in the Old Testament and it is in the New Testament. Look at this one in Hebrews 13. We are warned about being carried about with various and strange doctrines. What does the word strange mean? Here's something that's not authorized. And we have a responsibility commanded by God. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. God says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Don't believe every doctrine that you hear. Don't believe everything that you are taught, but try them, test them whether they are of God. How do you do that? How, how, do you, how do you avoid strange doctrines? How do you test which doctrines and teachings are right, which doctrine or practices are right or wrong? How do you figure that out? There's only one way to do it. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, the, the Bereans were described as more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched their traditions daily. That's not what your verse says. Because they searched uh, the rabbi's opinions daily. Because they searched, what is the word? The scriptures daily to see whether these things they were being taught were so. Hello. But it's the Apostle Paul teaching. You're going to believe everything he says, right? They searched the scriptures daily to see whether he was saying was so. What did they search? There's only one place to search. If you want to find out what is acceptable to God and what is authorized by God, there's only one place to search. I'm going to try to get through this next slide. We've got about five minutes. It's a little, uh, little more involved um, but uh, see if you can follow it with me. We have a responsibility from God to take a stand on Bible truth. We have a responsibility from God to find that which is authorized by God and to stand firm upon it. Not be swayed by those things that are not authorized and not be tempted uh, to go in various directions. Let me see if I can illustrate this, and this is not original with me. Um, this beautiful drawing is original with me. I, I drew that yesterday. I'm very talented uh, in, in that way. But I want you to think about, uh, that's a joke, obviously. I want you to think about the fact that Bible truth and Bible authority is like a mountain. When God says to stand firm, uh, to hold fast, to be immovable. That's where we need to be, is on Bible authority and Bible truth. To plant ourselves up here and to not go over to one extreme and to not go over to the other extreme, but to stay firmly planted on Bible truth. Why? Well, because you go to one extreme. And on the one side... There are people who make laws that God did not make. You ever known somebody who tried to 
make a law where God did not make one? Try to tell you that this is something you need to do where God didn't say that's something you need to do? But if you go to the other extreme, there are those laws that God did make, and yet there are those people who just disregard those. So on one extreme, people say, oh, good, the laws of God, those are great. Hey, let's make some more. And then there are the other extreme where people look at the laws of God and say, whoa, we don't need those. Let's just not follow those. We don't need to be on either one of those extremes. On the one extreme, there are those who take matters of opinion and treat them like they're matters of faith. Where they take their beliefs, their ideas, things they have heard, things they have grown to believe over the years, and they say these are matters of faith. These are things that are absolute necessities in obeying God. And of course, you know where the other extreme goes. The other extreme goes just the opposite way. It takes these matters of faith that are in the Word of God and say, oh, those are just matters of opinion. Yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but that's just your opinion about what that verse says. Another way of saying, and these are all really saying the same thing here, but on the one extreme, there are those who seek to bind where God has not bound. Say, so you have to do this, but God never bound that. And yet on the other extreme are those who seek to loose where God has bound. Or God says you have to do this, say, and they, kind of lo- they try to loosen that up. No, you really don't have to do that. Extremes can be, uh, uh, can be dangerous. Remember what the Bible says? Whatever we do, we've got to have Bible authority for it. And we don't need to go beyond what is written. If I go to one extreme or the other, if I go off of Bible truth, I have gone beyond what is written. And I can try adding to, or I can try taking away from, and the moment I do, I'm not standing on Bible truth any longer. I'm standing on human opinions, human doctrines, human commandments, and not the Word of God. Sometimes, man's tendency is to react from one extreme to the other. Have you ever noticed that? He's like like some kind of a rubber band or some kind of a bad pendulum that he realizes that, you know, maybe I'm not right. You're right. I shouldn't believe this. I shouldn't be here. uh, But instead of coming back here, they're like a rubber band and they shoot all the way over. And they might have one extreme, and all of a sudden they just swing full circle back to another extreme. Why do they do that? Why does that happen? Another way of saying that is that uh, extremes breed extremes. Why do they do that? They do that because they are not founded on the only foundation that exists. What did Peter say? There is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There's no other authority. So if I don't have a foundation, if I don't have authority, I can go all over the place. I can bounce back and forth and have no solid ground to stand on at all. What we've got to realize is the truth is right here. We don't have time to get to this, but I want us to realize, I know the bell is rung, these are coming up real slow, that God only authorizes one way. He authorizes by His Word and His Word alone. He's not going to authorize by what I believe, what I think, what I like. He's not going to authorize by what the church has always done. He's not going to authorize by what my mom says or my dad says or my grandma says or my preacher says. He's only going to authorize by the Word of God. So what I'm, what I'm planning for the next several weeks is for us to come to the Bible and say, okay, with this as our background, to say we must have Bible authority for all that we do. We've got to stand on Bible authority and not to, not to be, try to justify our actions by any of these things, but to only be authorized by the Word of God. The question is, how does He authorize? How does Scripture authorize my behavior and work and worship to God? We'll spend the next several weeks looking at those in detail. Joe? I agree. Joe says this is the most important topic that the church needs today, and I could not agree more. Uh, So please uh, be back here uh, next Sunday to, to look at this study.